Hello. Today we shall be discussing about urinary tract infections. One of the most common thing or problem or medical condition found in women. So let's see what how prevalent is this condition or how commonly you see this in real life. In 2007, so quite old statistics, we had 8 million ambulatory visits were because of a bladder infections. Of these, 84% were women, so predominantly it happens in women. There's a 13% annual incidence of bladder infections in women over the age of 18 years. And look at this, after a single episode of a bladder infection or a urinary tract infection, 30 to 44%, so over a third, women will have a second infection. And after two infections, over half of the women will have a third bladder infection. That is a very, very common problem. So let us understand what is the normal anatomy of the female urinary tract system. As you can see here, these are the two kidneys. The kidneys filter the blood and produce urine. This urine is then transported by these two tubes called the ureters, and they transport the urine into the bladder. This is the side view of the bladder and a woman standing up and seeing from the side or in profile. This is the front, this is the back, this is the top, and this is the bottom. So this is the pubic bone in the front. The bladder is right here. The urethra is the tube that brings the urine to the outside. And the female urethra is just a short four centimeter tube to the outside. Behind that is the vagina, the uterus on the top, and the rectum at the back. When you look from the vaginal opening, or what's also called the introitus, this is how it looks. So this is the, the a normal mons pubis, the clitoris. The urethra is inside the vaginal introitus. This is the hymenal remnant, and that is the vaginal cavity on the inside. And this is the inner lip of the labia, and this is the outer lip of the labia. And then you have this area called the perineum, and then the anus or the rectal opening. The classic way how urine is produced and stored and released is by this. So as you can see, these two tiny openings are the ureteral openings. They drop urine into the bladder. And the bladder then stores it and stores it until it is time for it to empty and then it squeezes and the urethra relaxes and the urine comes out. So it's one way out from the bladder through the urethra and out. And this is controlled by the nervous system. So when you talk about a bladder infection, let's talk about the bacteria that are influenced or cause this. And these are called the uropathogens or the UPs. The most common uropathogen, as you can see in this case, is E. coli. So E. coli is the number one bug that causes bladder infections more than in 50% of the patients. So this is called a gram negative, so it doesn't stain with the gram stain, rods or bacilli, and this is how it looks on electron microscopy. And then further, when you look at it, they have got these things called cilia or pili. And these pili, they use to attach to the surface tissue. So it's very hard to get rid of these guys because not only are they in a rod shaped with many, many pili, but these guys, the pili are like hooks and they anchor in. So even if you try to wipe in a little crevice, it, they can hang on. So let's see what is the normal course of events. So this is where they are normally present. That's why coli is the colon. So in the rectum, they're normally present, the E. coli. So they're there, that's fine. We don't have an issue with it. We just don't want them to come forward. So how do you get a bladder infection? So this is called a front movement of the bacteria. So now, if the bacteria are there at the anus opening, they slowly start moving forward and then forward and forward until they get to the urethra and that is how they may eventually get into the bladder. So as you can see here, the E. coli are here, now they're moving forward and forward and forward and now they gain entry into the bladder. Once they cross this special barrier from the urethra into the bladder, they can cause mayhem and symptoms of a bladder infection. That is called a cystitis, what I just showed you. Now, if it goes from the bladder up, 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 
it can cause a kidney infection and that's called retrograde retrograde that means from down up so from the urethra up into the bladder and from the bladder up into the kidneys on the other hand if there is a kidney disease such as stones or a kidney infection or kidney pus or just kidney chronic kidney damage then what you have is an antigrade that means it goes along the natural pathway so an infected kidney will infect the ureter the ureter will infect the bladder and that's how you get a downwards bladder infection so why when we when i showed you that slide over 84 percent of women get a bladder infection so why is it so common in women and what is it that predisposes women to get it more than men so let's look at the female anatomy. Remember when I told you the urethra is just a very short tube to the outside. So the bacteria are hanging around here. It won't take them too long to go up the small little ladder, just a four centimeter ladder and get into the bladder. Oh, that's interesting, a ladder into the bladder. Whereas if you look at the vaginal opening here and the anus, it's quite proximate. That means the vagina and the anus are not too far. And this area called the perineum may thin out, especially after childbirth, and may not be as robust as possible. And therefore, all the more, the bacteria may get entrance straight up into the vaginal opening and then the urethra. So when you compare that to a male urethra, see, this is the male urethra, which goes in the penis. So this is the penis, this is the scrotum. And you're looking at the, here from, this is the top, this is the bottom, this is the front, this is the back. So this is the rectum in a male. And then you have the prostate, the bladder is on top, the pubic bone is in the front, and then this is the male urethra. So how see how far it is from the anus. Also, it is a long tube. It's a 15 centimeter long tube. So it takes a while for the bacteria to go up and it may never happen that it may land up with a bladder infection. So in other words, the good news is for women is that if it's a bladder infection, you know, it can happen. It doesn't mean that there is something really bad is just because how the anatomy is however if there is a bladder infection in a guy that means usually there is some problem either there is a stone there is a prostate induced retention or something could be going on so the other reason is that the immune system so now you are the bacteria which is which are in the rectum you know your body may say okay you know what sometimes they may allow them to hang around here and allow them to hang around here but we do not want them to go any further if they go further, then you start getting a classic urinary tract infection. So up here, up here may be okay, but the problem is that if they are going any further, that leads to an infection. So there are some medical conditions that may predispose to a bladder infection, and it's obvious is diabetes. And diabetes can cause many things, but everybody likes sugar. Just like, like how you and I like sugar, so also the bacteria like sugar, and they can cause bladder infection symptoms. Steroid use and immunosuppression therapy is that our body immune system, like what I showed earlier, it protects us. It prevents these bacteria from moving forward and going into the bladder. However, if our immune system is compromised, then yes, there is a high likelihood of getting these bladder infections. Same thing with weight. Also, it changes the local environment also because of the obesity and there is increased uh, secretions at the same time increased moisture increased sweating and the hygiene is not that good and that could also predispose to bladder infections fecal soilage or with bowel leakage called accidental bowel leakage when a woman is just losing stool control and does not realizing it's happening or she cannot control it that stool soilage or constantly having stool in the pad could allow it to smear forward and the E. coli can then get access to the vagina and then the urethra. Let's see how menopause does this. That's a very interesting concept and it is happening more and more frequently as women obviously are living beyond the age of 50 all the way up to the mid 80s and now in the early 90s. So what happens with menopause and how do you get a urinary tract infection? So let's understand the lining. So this is essentially a lining of the vaginal epithelium as seen under the microscope. So you can see this lining is from here to here and is nice and thick and all these little dots are the nuclei. So it's a multinucleated, very nice and thick lining. Whereas after menopause, the same lining becomes extremely thin. That associated with decreased blood supply 
in the basal layer as opposed to here where there is this layer is very rich and you can see all red and here it's very pale so what this does it decreases the vaginal pH when there is normal estrogenization and this low pH is very important for preventing the bacteria from moving forward why because these guys are very happy the E. coli are very happy in the rectum but the pH is high at 7 it's called a neutral or slightly alkaline pH so they're very happy here but because the vaginal pH from the estrogenization is low at four or four and a half, it prevents these guys from coming forward, almost acts like an acid barrier to prevent the bacteria from moving forward and they hang around the anus and rectum and they go out and they do not come forward. However, what happens after menopause is this. The pH of the vagina, because of lack of estrogen, it goes up. And when the pH of the vagina goes up, similarly the pH of the urethra goes up, now it becomes the same as that of the rectum. And guess what? These guys are going to start moving forward from the rectum to the perineum, to the vagina, to the urethra, and then they can get easy access along this small, short ladder into the bladder. And now there is a bladder infection. So that is what happens in a postmenopausal woman, why she gets bladder infections frequently. Then there are some other causes, like urologic causes, such as retention. So this patient has a prolapse where the bladder is coming down, and because it's falling out, it's not emptying. And as it's not emptying, there is stagnant urine. Whenever there is stagnant water, it always breeds mosquitoes or insects or whatever it is. In this case, it breeds infection. Stagnant urine, bacteria remain there, they start growing there, and now you get a bladder infection. Or if it's a stone, a stone also does the same thing. It attracts the bacteria, the bacteria sort of hang around the stone and they grow and grow and grow and cause a bladder infection. Or if there is an outpouching of the urethra called a diverticulum. Now you may have heard of diverticula in the bowel. Many people have diverticulosis of the colon, but very rarely and sometimes you may have diverticulum of the urethra, which is an outpouching. And here again, the urine remains stagnant, stagnant, and causes an infection. Also, some other factors such as the mother having history of urinary tract infection somehow predisposes the daughters also to have a bladder infection. And in the patient herself, if she had a bladder infection at an early age, that suggests that she may have frequent bladder infections later on in life. So this basically points to an immune system that may be slightly deficient, that may be allowing the bacteria to cause an infection. We talk about sexual history, increased frequency, new partner, and use of a diaphragm, which is, you know, rarely used nowadays, and that's in, put inside the vagina, and a spermicidal jelly can increase the risk of bladder infections. So now the big question that I'm often asked is, is a urinary tract infection a sexually transmitted disease? Now, why do I get asked this question? That's because you know, many women feel that every, only when they have intercourse do they get a bladder infection. So it's not that the infection is happening all the time, but it happens only after intercourse. So now they're wondering that if I'm having sex and I'm having, getting bladder infections, that means this is something to do with sex. And is my partner, therefore, giving me the bacterium and getting me to develop the bladder infections? Well, let me explain what happened. So this is a woman lying down. So this is the bladder in the front. This is the urethra. This is the vagina. This is the uterus and the rectum at the back. So now this is how it's normally present. And this is during intercourse as the penis is getting into the vagina. If the E. coli are hanging around the rectum, obviously they're there, but now at the opening of the rectum, now at the opening of the perineum, and now at the opening of the urethra, during the act of coitus, as the penis is going back and forth, it tends to push the bacteria from the urethra into the bladder. So as it gets pushed into the bladder, that is what causes bladder infections. So it's a piston-like movement of the penis in the vagina that pushes the patient's own bacteria from the outside into the bladder. So when they were here, it was all right. The moment they get into the bladder, that causes an infection. So this is what happens. The bacteria go in and there is an infection. 
So we want it the opposite. So we want it to keep them there and it going in. So what are the symptoms of a urinary tract infection? So the classic symptom of a bladder infection are the sensation of urgency. I've got to go to the bathroom, got to go to the bathroom. Frequency means going almost every hour, if not more frequently, getting up a lot at night and feeling that I just went to the bathroom, but I have to go again. Dysuria, that means even if I go, it hurts to go and causes discomfort and then blood in the urine. So these are the typical symptoms from the bladder and the urine standpoint. Then if the infection goes up to the kidneys, then it can cause fever and chills. Now it's dangerous. Now it's becoming a full body infection. It's getting into the bloodstream, especially when you get chills and high temperatures, such as 102, 103 degrees Fahrenheit. Nausea and vomiting is again a sign of systemic infection and backache is a sign of a kidney infection. So once you get into this arena, now that is important to address it right away. We do not want you to wait. You want to call us and make sure that this is taken care of immediately. Here also, we do not want you to wait. So one of the most common emergencies, obviously, that we see in our practice is a bladder infection. However, this is one important thing to note. What about the elderly? What about the women who are over the age of 70? Now, they may behave a little differently. They may not have the classic symptoms of a urinary tract infection like what I just mentioned. They may have different symptoms and those are mental confusion, fatigability, and sudden deterioration of health. And she says, you know, I just don't feel well. You asked her, what day is it, mom? And she said, I don't know, maybe it's a Monday, is it? And you feel something is wrong with her. Now, this becomes even more confusing, especially if she has underlying confusion. So now, if the patient has underlying confusion and you feel that she's getting a little bit more confused and she has a background history of bladder infections, just have her go to the bathroom, look at the urine, and you may just smell the urine. If the urine looks cloudy and has an odor, then you want to get it checked out. I'm telling you, one of the major, major symptoms of a bladder infection in the elderly is mental confusion. It is not urgency and frequency. So if that happens to your mother, you better be careful and you should make sure that you get it checked out. If it happens to you and you are the patient and you feel something is not right, just get it assessed and swift treatment of a bladder infections and it's almost like a cloud just cleared and you can now see the blue sky. What are the findings? So when a patient comes in, what do we find? So when I do an exam, normally when I touch the bladder on vaginal examination, I mean, there should be minimal feeling of something, but if there is intense discomfort or pain that suggests that there could be cystitis or a bladder inflammation because of an infection. Pounding on the back, this is the back where the kidneys would be, and you go pound, pound, ow! And then she says, ow, right here, that means you know I, it could be possibly a kidney infection, what we call a CVA tenderness. And then look at the urine. And if it looks like this, well, something is clearly off. So we do the urine dipstick and analyze it and then look at a few uh, 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 criteria parameters. So we look at what's called leukocytes. Leukocytes are white blood cells. And whenever there is an inflammation, the white blood cells are always present. Nitrites are present if it is especially a bladder infection. But then again, to have nitrites, you have to have a product in the food called nitrates. And you should have certain bacteria that break down the nitrates into nitrites. And finally, we look at blood. So presence of blood, presence of nitrites, presence of leukocytes is usually a good indicator that this is a bladder infection. But remember, when a patient comes to us with symptoms of a bladder infection, and it looks classic symptoms, urgency, frequency, discomfort, and she says, you know, I think I have a bladder infection. There is no reason to always do this analysis, especially if it is few and far between that she gets these. Let's say she last infection she got was a couple of years ago. In that case, we could just treat her on the phone and say, that's okay, you know, if that's what's going on, yeah, let me call in a basic antibiotic and see how you do. And if your symptoms don't improve, then yes, you need further assessment. If she's in the office, all you may want to do is this dipstick. And if it confirms it, well, especially if it goes really, really strong with uh, leukocyte esterase, then you know there is something going on and clearly there is an infection. 
in some cases, especially when she has had this quite frequently, then you want to say, you know what, I better make sure that this is truly a bladder infection and it's not something else going on. So in these patients, it's important that we send it for urine culture to determine not only whether, number one, it is an infection, that is important to find out in some in women, especially if they're getting these frequently. Number one, that it's an infection. Number two, what would be the best antibiotic to give the patient which has the least complications? And that'll help us by doing the urine culture. So what are the principles? Now that we've talked about you know, what are the symptoms, why does it happen in women, what typical complaints do they have, what could be the office test that could be done, now let us talk about certain principles of how to take care of this bladder infection. Key thing is confirm the diagnosis. You've got to make sure that you have the right diagnosis. Like I told you, we do not need to get urine cultures in everybody. If it is a simple, you know, infrequent symptoms and she says, yeah, I had it three years ago or four years ago, you could just go by the history and listen to her symptoms and you know that this is more likely than not a bladder infection with the warning and the caveat to tell the patient, that, hey, listen, I'm going to give you this antibiotic, but if you have persistent symptoms, you need to come in and we need to see what's going on. Then you get a urine analysis, you get the urine culture. The key is to treat with an appropriate antibiotic. And this is most important now, most important that we talk about when we discuss antibiotics, and that is collateral damage. So what is collateral damage? Collateral damage is when you look at the balance of benefits of an antibiotic versus the side effects and the risks. So the risks outweigh the benefits, that means you have high collateral damage. And especially in a case that you are not sure, is this a bladder infection or not? So what if a patient has symptoms of a bladder infection and you know that this sounds like a bladder infection, then you want to start her on an antibiotic that, that is a better from the benefit standpoint and has low side effect profile. So keep it simple. Don't give an antibiotic which is a high collateral damage. So that's important to understand. Now, what you should also remember is that just because you did fine last time with a particular antibiotic does not mean that this time again, you have no complications. Now, this is very important to understand. Why? Because many times, and all of us have been guilty to some extent of self-medicating. Well, you know, husband got an antibiotic, it's lying at home, maybe I'll just take it rather than go to a doctor's office. Or, you know, I took the antibiotic last time, let me take it, you know, I don't have time, I'm working, I cannot make it to the office when these guys are open, so I'll just take this medication and I'll be fine. Well, it's likely that you would be fine, but it's also a problem if something goes wrong and what could go wrong. And I'll tell you that in a second. The other thing is just make sure that if you are getting an antibiotic after antibiotic by your doctor, even your doctor, you go to your doctor and he gives you an antibiotic and your symptoms go away for a few days and they come back again and he gives you another antibiotic or says, take this antibiotic for now two weeks and take it for a month. Well, that's a red flag. Be careful. An educated patient is the most helpful resource. So if you are educated, you know what's going on, you'll be able to take care of yourself well. So what could happen? Ciprofloxacin, there is a black box warning that it could rupture the tendon. This is the Achilles tendon in the ankle, and if it breaks it, well, you're walking with a crutch. So be very careful if you have got joint pains when taking ciprofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin is a drug which is excellent if it is appropriately indicated. For most cases of uncomplicated cystitis, you don't need ciprofloxacin. So do not take ciprofloxacin or the quinolones like Leviquin. You know, I know there are some stores and the grocery stores or pharmacies that'll give you ciprofloxacin for a song. You know, it's dirt cheap. And you may say, hey, let me just take it rather than take some other things that my doctor recommended. Well, it may be cheap in cost, but you may pay a price somewhere else. Right here or right here which is in your bowel so you see this is the achilles tendon rupture and this is called c difficile clostridium difficile infection of the bowel called pseudomembranous enterocolitis i mean if you get this you are in the hospital in an isolation room and that's it 
and you will always have the clostridium difficile and anytime you take an antibiotic these guys could come back with a vengeance so now this is not only specific for ciprofloxacin it could happen with other antibiotics broad spectrum such as penicillins and cephalosporins so that's why when you take an antibiotic you have to be careful just don't assume that last time i was fine this time i'll be fine what is it in popping a pill it's not as simple as it sounds so please be careful and listen to your doctors now if the symptoms continue now you have to be aware what is going on i just took a good antibiotic that my doctor recommended and my symptoms are still going on what is happening is it a reinfection or a persistence of an infection what does that mean so let's look at this graph here so now here there's nothing she's doing well and now the symptoms start oh my god i'm urgency frequency disorder boom 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 classic uti diagnosed treated treat 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 gone she's doing great and she continues to go, do great however here is another patient she is doing good 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 symptoms start urgency frequency bad 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 it's all dysuria bladder infection diagnosed now she's given an antibiotic it goes off for a few days and in a few days it comes back again so it's not really gone completely it hangs out so this is a, if it goes away completely and then comes back but after having gone out completely it's called a reinfection this on the other hand is a persistence that means the infection never got completely eradicated so you see this is where an infection got completely eradicated it was over and then it restarted again that's a reinfection but if it is an ongoing saga it never went off completely it it got knocked off a little bit you know but was a not a complete knockout it's still hanging around how do you do this what do you do so get a urine culture say hey all right let's see if it's there or not we get an appropriate sensitivities get the appropriate antibiotic on board then do something called test of cure that means at the completion of the antibiotic you again repeat the culture to make sure that the infection is gone so you want this scenario so you've treated her now you do a urine culture right here and it should be completely negative the infection's gone say so, okay we're good to go if on the other hand if it is an ongoing thing then we need to see look into it further so what are the typical antibiotics that I would recommend as a first line and not just me is infectious disease society of America IDSA what does IDSA recommend the first line are these macrobid bactrim and phosphomycin these are the three first lines so you should almost memorize this that these are the three antibiotics that your doctor should be prescribing you the first time around now bactrim the problem is that a lot of people have sulfa allergy or bactrim has a high resistance in the community so that may not be the great drug to give but nitrofurantoin macrobid is clearly the number one drug ciprofloxacin is clearly not the number one drug not the number one drug not the number one drug remember that it's not so it should be used as a backup or if there is a bad infection such as a kidney infection fever and chills then yes that's when ciprofloxacin is indicated the you know cephalosporins like keflex is indicated but not for infections just of a bladder or urgency frequency dysuria like cystitis infections so please remember this typical duration about three days and maybe five days very some occasionally seven days if complicated that means it happens quite frequently then we may go up to a lengthy time period of seven days rarely would i go up to 14 days and if i went here i would then be doing the test of cure to make sure that this infection is going away so now let's talk about so we talked about now the treatment of urinary tract infections i told you about the antibiotics we mentioned about what is collateral damage we talked about the good and the bad of the antibiotics we discussed which antibiotic to take i also discussed with you the difference between recurrent infection that is reinfection versus persistence of infections so now let's look at what defines recurrent urinary tract infection so these are reoccurring so reinfections these are not persistent infections but reoccurring so any woman who has two culture proven infections in a six month period or three in a year is considered as a urinary tract infection now when you look at from the point of view of urinary tract infection and you're seeing okay what is happening and why 
It happens due typically due to a different bacteria or beyond a two week interval. If it is within two weeks or by the same bacteria, it's usually a relapse. So what do we do for that? I look inside the bladder. So this is a cystoscope that I'm looking in. It's in the bladder right here. The woman is lying down, head is up here. So she's watching, I'm watching, We're watching on the TV screen, making sure the bladder looks all right. We get a CT scan with dye of the kidney. So you can actually see the entire kidney architecture. You make sure it looks good. There's no stone or no hydronephrosis, which is a swelling of the kidneys, no swelling of the ureters. There is no filling defect, they're nice and good and then we look at the bladder. So mainly with the telescope, we can only look inside the bladder and the urethra. With the CT, you can look above that into the ureters and the kidneys. This is how a red angry bladder would look at cystoscopy. So once we do some ev uh, evaluations such as urine analysis, urine culture, examination to make sure that she's emptying her bladder well, she does not have retention and any of the causes that we discussed earlier. Then we look inside the bladder and also do a, a kidney evaluation. Once all that is done, then we look at, okay, how do we manage this? So what are the principles of management? First of all, it is important to not only confirm the diagnosis, but treat it appropriately. So you can see that, yep, we do the agar and do the urine culture and say, okay, the bacteria grew. Now we put the appropriate antibiotic and see, okay, how well does the antibiotic kill it? So this one kills it beautifully around it. And as you can see, it's all clear around. The more the clear area, the better is the antibiotic. And that's how we determine that sensitivity and which antibiotic to give. If there's any underlying cause, like what I mentioned, if there is retention, we take care of that. But if there's prolapse and urine is not emptying, or if there is a stone, then we, that has to be removed. Then we go on to what is called preventative or prophylactic antibiotic. So what does that mean? This is a antibiotic that is given on a daily basis. First of all, we make sure that the urine culture prior to starting this is negative. That means there is no infection. It, this thing decreases the risk of recurrent bladder infections by 95%. So if a woman is getting back to back to back bladder infections by giving a low dose of an antibiotic on a continuous basis, it basically knocks it off almost completely. So it la could go from anywhere from six months to two years of the antibiotic use, may even be extended up to five years. Now you're, you may be thinking, uh, you know, Dr. Kandwala just mentioned that um, antibiotics could have collateral damage, then how come I'm taking this antibiotic on an ongoing basis? Because what you're doing is you're taking a very small dose of a very basic antibiotic with the goal of preventing it. Because if you get an infection, then yes, we have to give you a stronger antibiotic for a longer dose and longer course, and that could itself cause damage. So here you're preventing damage by preventing getting these bladder infections by giving a low dose small tablet every night now if you stop it 50 to 60 percent will get reinfected in three months after stopping it and the typical course for most people i mean you could go up to two years but typical course what we do is usually six months so how does it work so now see you know that e coli was in the rectum now it moved up to the perineum it moved up to the urethral opening and now it's hanging around happily in the bladder causing these bladder infections so when you take the antibiotic and you take the tablet, it decreases the colonization of bacteria here. So yep, they're in the bowel, they come down to the anus opening, they come to the perineum, see where the dose is starting to decrease. Now they come up here, it's knocking it off and come here even lower dose and go into the bladder and much lower dose. So then when you actually urinate, it gets flushed out. So the dose that is there of the bacteria, the colony in the bacteria are so low that they get washed away at urination. So this is how an antibiotic works. It prevents these guys from hanging around the urethra and therefore going into the bladder. This is a low dose of an antibiotic taken nightly. For example, if the dose of macrobid is 100 milligrams twice a day as a treatment dose for five days, this dose is 50 milligrams nightly for the next few months. The other treatment we could do is something called postcoital interception or postcoital antibiotics. So if a woman says that, you know what, any other time I'm fine, but after sex, man, I almost always get a bladder infection. 
So I told you, this is not a sexually transmitted disease, but it's just because these guys are hanging around the opening. Now, if she was getting frequent bladder infections, I would have put her on an antibiotic on an ongoing basis. But since she has it only after sex, we will just give an antibiotic after sex. So in this case, she takes an antibiotic immediately after intercourse. And these are the typical antibiotics that could be given for that reason. So again, what about menopause? Remember, we talked about menopause. Now, if can we use estrogen? And you know what? Especially if the patient has other symptoms such as vaginal dryness and discomfort during intercourse, absolutely, it makes a lot of sense to use vaginal estrogen. Because remember, whenever the vaginal pH is acidic, the bacteria will be held back. They won't come forward into that. Not only will they be held back and prevent to go forward, but also they'll be prevented from going into the bladder. So it's important to again recalibrate the vaginal pH to an acidic level so that this alkaline bacteria do not move forward and cause a bladder infection. What other things could we do? So we talked about different measures. The other things that you can do are taking something called methanamine, which gets broken down to formaldehyde and again, acidifies the urine and the same mechanism as I discussed with estrogen. Probiotics do the same thing. Cranberry tablets. Now, you know, the jury's out on this, by the way. Cranberry juice, forget about it. All you'll get is sugar. Cranberry tablets, on the other hand, may have some role with E. coli because they have something called proanthocyanidines and proanthocyanidines or PACs decrease the binding of the E. coli to the bladder lining. So they are not allowed to bind and therefore they're flushed out. However, you know, it's not completely confirmed in clinical studies that that's effective. But if someone likes to take supplements and she's taking cranberry tablets, I'm not going to say no. D manos and M4284, which is a fake manos, also can be taken for this purpose. And it's very, very interesting how it works. So this is the Europathogen E. coli, UPEC. So this guy, remember the UPEC has got all those pili, those hooks. So what the hook does, it goes and attaches to the manos, which is on top of the lining of the bladder. And because it attaches here, it causes a bladder infection. However, if you give D manos from the outside, like here, It'll go and attach to the D manos. Once it attaches to the pili, the pili cannot attach down to the lining of the bladder and it gets flushed out and gets cleared when you urinate. So that is one of the mechanisms that we think manos works. But again, it has not been shown in clinical trials to be very effective. Some of the things that you could do with this, but clinical trial is lacking. Self-treatment with an antibiotic, like, you know, should you do it on your own? If you are certain that and you're getting infrequent bladder infections, you could do a dipstick, but the rate of infection recurrence is very high compared to continuous prophylaxis, that preventative antibiotic. And if the symptoms don't improve, then you need to follow up. So I'm not really gungo about this unless the patient re really knows what she's doing. What about the other measures? And you're thinking, what about, he's not talking about all those other things, wipe front to back, void urination after having sex, urinate more frequently to flush out the bacteria, avoid hot tubs, bubble baths or tampons. Yeah, you know, these all make sense and I agree, it makes complete sense. However, because I'm evidence-based and I should be telling you evidence-based information, it is these are not validated by clinical studies. And the jury is again out, some studies show yay, some studies show no change. But you know what? These are simple practices. It doesn't cost anything. It doesn't hurt. You know, so why not wipe front back, front to back, you know, safest way to do it. Let me end by saying a few words on asymptomatic bacteriuria. What, are that, what does that mean? Suppose if you go to a doctor's office for a physical and they send the urine out and it comes like, oh, look at that, 100,000 colony forming units per ml. Now, this by definition is a bladder infection. Now, if you get this, then if the patient does not have symptoms, does not have any bladder symptoms, do not treat. Because if I treat you, then I could do more harm than good. As we discussed, the collateral damage increases plus the antibiotic resistance. The guys who are hanging around in the colon, they will learn how to resist that antibiotic. So when you really have a bladder infection, you will not be able to kill with that antibiotic that you just got. So if the patient, if you does do not have symptoms, do not take an antibiotic. 
All in all, very common problem. One of the most common medical office visits in the United States, bladder infections, high cost to society, recurrent UTIs should be managed carefully, diagnosed correctly and properly. Elderly behave differently, gotta be aware of that. No symptoms, no treatment. Do not take an antibiotic on your own, no self-medication. Persistent infection, are you sure it's an infection? Make sure the doctor sends the urine for culture. Do you really have a bladder infection? There could be another condition called bladder pain syndrome, which has similar, exactly identical symptoms to a, bla uh, to a bladder infection, and you may have that instead. So be very careful. Make sure that the urine is sent out and the doctor confirms it is a positive urine culture. If it is recurrent or persistent bladder infections, then yes, you would need a thorough evaluation. So all in all, very common problem, very important to make sure that we just do not indiscriminately use antibiotics and you and I have to work together. So an informed patient, once you're informed with all this information, you will know how to take care of yourself and you'll come to see us when it is right and at the same time, prevent your doctors from just giving you antibiotic after antibiotic after antibiotic.